The Mesozoic is arguably the most famous of Earth eras, namely because of the public's favourite group of prehistoric creatures, dinosaurs. With these giant creatures stomping around, it's pretty easy to imagine all other groups scurrying away from them. But Repenobanus does actually serve as a great example about how dinosaurs might have had a little bit more to worry about when it came to mammals. So, as we all know, mammals didn't really reach megafaunal levels until the Cenozoic, typically not getting any larger than a house cat before this. However, in 2000, a new mammal was named from the Yizian formation of China, Repenomammus robustus, with a second species named five years later as Repenomammus giganticus. The Yizian formation is something I've touched on a few times before, and it's famous for its exceptional preservation, mostly of dinosaurs, but that's something I'll get into soon enough. First, let's take a look at the animal itself. Repenomammus is currently the sole member of its family, the Repenomammids, and is close enough to the Gobiconodontids that it is sometimes assigned to this family instead. Now, the idea of a typical mammal is a little confusing by extant standards, given the variety of the group today, but mammal diversity was much lower at this time, and Repenomammus did indeed seem like your typical Mesozoic mammal. The head of this guy seems superficially similar to canids, with a relatively long body and short legs, of which were actually plantigrade as opposed to digitigrade. This little mammal also showcased a feature in its pelvis that might give away its method of producing young, since a pair of bones that projected out, known as the epipubic bones, were found on Repenomammus. This pair of bones are found in modern non-placental mammals, and whilst the function isn't agreed upon, therefore doesn't serve as direct evidence of how Repenomammus produced young, it does imply that this mammal shared more traits in life with marsupials and monotremes, so it may have either laid eggs or given birth to undeveloped young that it carried in a pouch. In terms of skin covering, we don't really know exactly how Repenomammus would have looked in life, but as a mammal, it's pretty safe to assume that this was a little furry boy. Speaking of little, Repenomammus, as stated, was one of the biggest mammals to come out of the Mesozoic and measured in at up to 50 centimeters or 19.7 inches and between 4 to 6 kilograms, or 8.8 .8 to 13 pounds. Being around the same size is no possum. However, these are just the measurement for the type species are robustus. The second species, are giganticus, was much bigger, with fully grown adults reaching sizes of a metre, or 3 foot 3 inches, and 12 to 14 kilograms, or 26 to 31 pounds, making it bigger than many dinosaurs. There was one thing to be technically big enough to bully a dinosaur, but it's a completely different story when there's actual evidence of it, which I'll get into soon enough. Like I said, Wapenomammus was recovered from the famous Yizian Formation, which was deposited in northeast China during the early Cretaceous, between 125.8 to 124.1 million years ago. This area was covered in subtropical to temperate forests, with the humid conditions being intermittently broken by the odd dry season. It was also a lot colder in this region, at least for the Mesozoic, with yearly average temperatures of 10 degrees Celsius, or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, with the particularly cold winters being possibly caused by China's high latitude at the time. Now the Yizian Formation has been incredibly kind with the amount of fossils that is preserved in exquisite detail, just so you know that this list will be long, and I'm barely scratching the surface. Along with the plentiful invertebrates and freshwater fish, there are a few small freshwater aquatic reptiles, along with both fully ground-dwelling and gliding lizards. A high amount of various mammals alongside Repenomammus, such as Yanoconodon, Jeholodens, Gobiconodon, Maltherium, and Eomaya, and of course, dinosaurs are plenty. These include Liaoningosaurus, Liaoceratops, Ornithopods like Bolong and Jeholosaurus, Sauropods like Dongbei Titan, Euhalopus, and Liaoninga Titan, and even potential stegosaur material, along with plenty of theropods, such as Sinocalyopteryx, the famous Sinosauropteryx, Tianyuraptor, Gracilaraptor, Shenziaosaurus, Gulditeryx, Bapiaosaurus, Raptorex, Eutyranus, Cynornithoides, Microraptor, and countless avialans. So with all these giant creatures around, surely Rapanomamus didn't get all that ballsy, right? Well, as stated already, this mammal is one of the only examples of mammals actually not only challenging dinosaurs to fights, but eating them. A paper was published back in 2005 describing a specimen of Rapanomammus, 
with the remains of none other than a juvenile Cetacosaurus, which I talk more about here, found in its stomach. Now granted, this kind of behaviour would be pretty common for a carnivore in general, since any juvenile dinosaur small and young enough to be in the nest would be easy pickings. Plus, stomach contents doesn't necessarily mean they were taken on the live animal, right? Well, that was also put to rest when an incredible find was published just last year. An abrusion deposit, namely a volcanic debris flow, happened to interrupt and bury a vicious fight. Locked in combat forevermore was our Repenomamus with a fully grown adult Cetacosaurus. With the plucky little mammal latching onto the side of the dinosaur with its fore and hind limbs whilst biting into it. I don't know what Repenomamus had against the Tachosaurus, but hey ho. Having said that, if Repenomamus was an active predator and wasn't shy about the big shot dinosaurs, it's not likely that other smaller dinosaurs were safe from this guy. So it may have preyed upon the likes of Gracilaraptor, Sinornithosaurus, Tianyuraptor, Sarnoceropteryx, Mai, the list goes on. The potential list gets even longer if Repenomamus had the temperament and ballsy nature to go for larger animals than itself, like a fully grown Cetacosaurus. Hell, if it was anything like a wolverine or honey badger, then I can imagine even ornithopods like Bolong wanting to keep their distance from this scrapper. But forget what Bolong thinks, I want to hear what you guys think about this little guy down in the comments below whilst I answer today's question, which comes from Uncle Tim the Hurtabit, uh, who has asked... Given the chance, what group of dinosaurs would have been most likely to become dominant across the globe like humans have? Hmm. Uh, okay, so there's a few different answers to kind of go down here since speculating about an alternative future is actually more complicated than it sounds. First up, who to say that any group would have done? Us humans have this idea that we are the dominant species on the planet, therefore if we weren't here, some other animal would fill our niche, right? Not necessarily. Homo sapiens have done what we have done under very specific circumstances and adaptations, namely a level of intelligence to get new ideas and innovate, and the dexterity to build tools. From there it was simply a case of travelling around the world and having the ability to make lives easier for ourselves rather than evolving specific physical adaptations for new environments. This way a single species can reach out globally without having to speciate into more diverse groups. In short, we've been able to spread out everywhere and been able to invent ways to make a given environment as convenient as possible for us, meaning that we don't really have to change physically. Then when we look at other animals that gained global dominance, they eventually speciated and changed into a diverse clave. The humans have done what we've done in around 100,000 years, but let's not forget that dinosaurs were around for 167 million years. So if any group was going to do what we've done, they probably would have done it in that time frame. But others had this idea, most famously back in the 80s, when a conceptual model was made showing how the most intelligent group, the Trilodontids, might have evolved into a more humanoid form with the associated intelligence. Now this was and still is criticised heavily, mostly because a humanoid morphology isn't the quote-unquote best, and dinosaurs were doing just fine without it. So I don't think that any particular group would have gained dominance beyond the scope of theropods or sauropods. But what the hell, there's nothing stopping us from having a bit of fun with this. Now I'm not sure that I want to look at intelligence necessarily, because that would take us back down the Trilodontid path, and while they were among the most intelligent in Dinosauria, we're still talking about the kind of intelligence seen in many birds. Still really intelligent, but not world-dominatingly intelligent. Because, well, they haven't done that. I also don't think this would happen with any particular species, but you did say group, so I'm going to be looking at groups of dinosaurs on the family slash superfamily level. We need to look at clades that were either in the northern hemisphere when the continents were connected via land bridges, or managed to spread out when Pangaea was present. Then we need a group that was generalist enough that they could fill almost all niches, those being carnivorous and herbivorous niches at most size ranges. Now omnivorous dinosaurs were a thing, and many groups like sauropods started off eating meat. So retroactively turning one or two other members of family into the opposite shouldn't be out of the question. That way they can claim true dominance. My picks for this would either be tyrannosauroids, hadrosaurs, or gemaiosaurs, personally, but if you feel like it would be a different one, please let me know down below. In short, could dinosaurs have taken over the same way humans have? 
Personally, I don't think so. Uh, and even if a group did take over, they would still speciate into a lot of different looking groups. I hope that's a satisfying answer to your question. I appreciate you submitting that just as much as I appreciate everyone watching this far into the video. Your support means a lot, and I really look forward to catching you next time.